right, well, welcome to Meta Church. If you're new with us, my name is Clayton. I'm so glad that you guys have joined us. And I want to say welcome to all, everyone who has tuned in, everyone in Holotus online and at the 151 Saloon. Uh, next week, we're starting a brand new series called Family Traditions. We're really, really excited about it. And uh, today I had one more message before we jump into another series uh, that has really been on my heart for some time now. This is uh, another one of these messages, like we've been talking about sacrifice, and I had to get that out because it's so critical to our lives. And, and this is another one of those that is, is worth understanding and, and that has really weighed on me over the last few years as a pastor. This is the kind of message, you know, every once in a while we'll joke about uh, how if you take notes and messages, you're getting like some extra credit in heaven or something like that. But th this is one of those messages where I'm going to walk step by step through real action you can take for life change. And so you might not have pen and paper, but you probably have a, a smartphone that you could put to good use and take some of these notes today. The reason that I'm discussing today's topic is because I've seen a trend, especially over about the last five years of ministry, and it's people coming to me in pastoral counseling sessions who are just beside themselves with how they are feeling about themselves and the world around them. People who are overwhelmed by anxiety or drowning in depression, people who just can't even believe the anger and the rage that is inside of them. People who feel confused, skeptical, divided. And here's the key factor is the trend I have seen is not in people who have always dealt with depression or always been angry people. It's, it's something that is new inside of them. And they all say, I have no idea how I became like this. Like they weren't normally a nervous person, but now they're skittish and anxious about all aspects of life. They weren't normally an angry person, but now they feel like they could just explode on anybody at any moment. Now, a good deal of this lately can be blamed on the pandemic, but this is a trend I was seeing far before COVID, far before lockdowns and quarantines, and now the pandemic has just exacerbated the problem. Today, I wanna to talk about information. And we are living in the information age. And I bring that up every once in a while because part of living out the purpose God has placed on your life is being able to accurately map out where you are in the world and where you are headed in your life. And one of the key defining aspects of where we find ourselves in history is that we are in the information age. And the techno technological advancements that have happened in all of our lifetimes are so significant we have no idea what we're dealing with. I'm not that old. I'm one of the older millennials. I'm, I find myself kind of right on the edge between a couple of generations. And I don't know if you saw it, but there was a new term that was coined this week. It was trending all over social media, and it is about people my age. They're now calling us geriatric millennials. <laughs> Any geriatric millennials in the house? Like, you feel too old to be a millennial, but you're not quite old enough to be Gen X. Geriatric millennials, and people were really frustrated about this. Millennials were really up in arms about being called geriatric millennials. And I got to tell you, I have never felt more seen. It is like there has never been a phrase that has described my life to a T. I wake up at 5. I nap by 2 p.m. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm in it to win it. I love it. And it's so true. And there is a difference, and it's an important distinction, because the people who are younger, the younger millennials below the geriatric millennials, they have one key factor that totally differentiates the way they see the world. They don't remember life before the internet. And like we're so immersed in it that maybe it's hard for you sometimes. You might be 70, and you're like, oh yeah, we didn't always have the internet. It's like kind of recent, and the internet changed the game. And if you just think about 40 years ago, the way that we took in information, it was radically different, radically different. If you wanted to really stay up to date on current events, you would start your morning by reading the newspaper, and all of Gen Z says, the what? That's right. 
There were papers delivered to your door. They were ginormous. You had to read in things that weren't emojis. It was a big deal, you know? And then if you wanted some more news, wanted to find out what happened that day, there were like two or three news channels, and they happened for a couple of hours at night. And if you wanted like to know more information about the world, you know, if you wanted to discover something about the Bermuda Triangle or a, a certain species of catfish, if you wanted to know how many miles we are away from the moon, you had to go to your encyclopedia. There were people who would knock on your door to try to sell you 75 pounds of books. The encyclopedia has no autocorrect. If you don't know how to spell it, you are just out of luck. This is how information happened. Our social circles were as big as the number of people that we could actually get to in real life. If you wanted to call someone, you had to have their phone number memorized in your brain. And so our information was extremely limited, like extremely limited. We could read books, we could read papers, we could study encyclopedias, we could watch about an hour of news, and that was it. And that was 30 or 40 years ago. And then the internet came along. And all the geriatric millennials remember not having a computer in the house, not even really knowing what a computer was. And then you remember the internet. And I'll tell you right now, if you've never dialed up to the internet, I don't want to hear about back in your day, you know? It's like, what day? Thursday? Dialing up was so pointless. And the internet was so slow. And so we had a lot more access to information, but it was slow going. And around that time, there's talk radio, and talk radio comes on. And so now you can turn on an AM station, and you can get all the current events for hours a day on your way to work. But it was still rather limited. And then the internet got faster. And then the cable news networks became 24 hours a day. And now you have the internet, and you can get on any time, and you can Google anything in the world. And you can get access to all the current events at the click of a button. And you can turn on your television, and you can see the current events any moment of any day. And it is worth appreciating that that is a massive, massive change in the level and the quantity of information that we began taking in. In 2008, Apple put out the iPhone. By 2011, everyone you knew had a smartphone in their pocket. That was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we put all of the information in all of the world collected across all of human history in our pockets. And the reason that I want to talk about this today is because we have no idea what that has done to us. When you look at how you actually study history and how you come to real scientific conclusions about things like sociology or how new technology affects us, you can't know truly until after it has happened. You have to look back and study it, and we're still in the middle of it. Five or six years ago, social media took over. Five years ago, you could find people who didn't have a social media platform. Now everyone has multiple. And they're just getting better, and they're getting better at holding our attention, and they're getting better at sucking us in. And, and now we're in a place where for many people, their digital reality is more real than their actual reality. We have no idea the change that has taken place. We have no idea what this diet of constant information is doing to us. And 10 years in, we're beginning to see some evidence of it in the statistics. And mental health is absolutely falling apart in our country and falling apart in our world. Anxiety and depression are hitting unprecedented levels. We are more anxious and more depressed than people who are living through a world war and a Great Depression all at the same time. Our suicide rates are going through the roof. And over and over and over again, people sit down across from me and they don't understand how their lives have taken the form that their lives have taken. 
We're all constantly taking in unbelievable amounts of information. This is a science experiment we're all running in real time that has never, ever been tried before. We are the guinea pigs for the technological revolution, and I believe technology is incredible. And right now we are simulcasting to other venues, and we are broadcasting onto people's phones the good news of Jesus Christ. Technology is a beautiful thing when used the right way. But if it is left untrammeled, if we don't understand the significance of what we are living through, then we will become victims of our technology, and we're seeing evidence of that in all of our own lives, and there's bias. All of the information is biased, and the news that you're taking in is biased, and, and I don't just mean political bias, and I don't care if you're like CNN or Fox News. There is a bias there, and the first bias is not political. The first bias is always profit. These are companies, and they got to pay bills, and they got to pay salaries, and they got to make money, and they got to keep investors happy, and so they have to get eyeballs to the screen. That's how they make their money. Adver advertisers will advertise when eyeballs are on the screen, and so they are fighting for your attention, and what that means is their first priority is not giving accurate information, it is giving enticing information. There was a study that was done across the developed countries in the world during the pandemic, and the question that the study was trying to discover is, how were they reporting on COVID-19, this worldwide pandemic? And what they found is that every developed country split between good news and bad news almost exactly 50-50. There was obvious bad news. People were dying by the tens and the hundreds of thousands. Every day, new things were locked down. There was obvious bad news. But there was obvious good news as well, and we got better at the therapeutics, and, and there were good stories coming out of it, and the vaccines were coming along, and there was good news and bad news in the developed countries of the world. They put out half good news and half bad news, and the one outlier I bet you can guess is the United States of America. Over 80% of the reporting was bad news. Over 80% of it was bad news, and of course it was. Because the first priority is not what is accurate, the first priority is what is enticing. And the internet was supposed to decentralize our information. And it did for a while, but now the big tech giants online are as big of a big business as anything else. And they run on algorithms. And the algorithms aren't concerned with accuracy, they are concerned with enticement. And so they sell division, and they sell fear, and they put it right into your hands for most people for multiple hours a day. This is what we're digesting. Information isn't just the news, it's your social circle. It's the people that you allow in your life. It's the gossip that you take in. It's the people that you follow and compare yourself to online. We're taking in more information than we know what to do with. It's information overload. Most of it is toxic. We get to the end of it all and throw our hands up, not able to understand how we are so anxious, depressed, divided, and angry. Today, I want to talk about it. I want to see what Scripture has to say about it. I also want us to really understand how this is affecting our life. Katie and I have some good friends, Lee and Christine Wong. And you guys know Lee Wong because he comes and preaches for us sometimes. But you might not know his better half. Christine is a, a PhD. She's a professor here in San Antonio. And she's also a, a counselor. She is a clinician. And, and she has studied the effects of this at a high, high level. She agreed to sit down with me and to discuss this issue to help us understand it at a deeper level. You guys check this out. So Christine, tell us a little bit about what you do as a professor at Texas A&M University here in San Antonio, and a little bit about what you do in your clinical practice. Well, I'm an assistant uh, professor of counseling there, and we have master's level programs that prepare our graduates to be clinical mental health counselors, school counselors, and couples and family counselors. And so the courses that I teach are counseling techniques, and I teach our clinical mental health internship as well. Uh, my research interests include um, how we can incorporate spirituality and religion into the counseling session, as well as how we can best serve marginalized populations. Um, I also do see clients for substance use issues, usually concurrent with PTSD or post-traumatic stress syndrome. And so part of my job is to explore with the client how we can find um, safer ways to cope with our experiences. 
in your own research and your own practice, um, how have you seen this pandemic change the way that people are interacting with media? Mm -hmm. Well, I know just personally, um, I remember the week that we had our stay home, work safe order here yeah. in San Antonio. Um, the news was on 24 seven. Mm. Um, when the mayor came on and um, the, the judge uh, made that announcement, it was like, what is happening? Right. There was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear and anxiety. So um, a way for me to kind of um, control the situation was to watch the news and to read the news on my phone. So I know for, for me, I was just 24 seven, as soon as I woke up, what's happening, what's right. going on? Do I need to go buy toilet paper? Right. You know, like, <laughs> what's, what do I need to do? And um, it was that way for a while. And I remember me and my brother sending each other articles back and forth, um, reading medical journals to figure out like what's right, real, right. What's, what's just the media um, inducing. So um, media consumption increased so much for me. I don't know about you. And then uh, started working from home. Uh, many of us did, and many of us were also laid off from work. Wow. And so with being at home so much, yeah. um, what, is, what is there to do, right? We can't mm -hmm. go anywhere. Our normal modes of entertainment are gone. Uh, we can't hang out with our friends. So we're online, we're watching TV, right. we're streaming constantly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the research backs that up. So uh, I was reading that um, I think for both kids and adults, mm -hmm. it increased, which makes sense because parents who now had kids at home, <laughs> uh, you had to figure out a way to entertain them for eight hours while you're working, which right. is really hard. And yeah. so um, for kids um, of all ages, that increased by, by so much, um, as mm -hmm. well as parents um, mm -hmm. watching the news while they're working as well, trying to see what's happening. What kind of effects have you seen from this increase in mm -hmm. mass media consumption? Yeah, well, you know, uh, it's the pandemic, and then we also had this civil unrest going on at the same time, yeah. and people out there protesting um, systemic structures, and mm -hmm. we had this very tumultuous election. Yeah. So the news coverage was a constant, and, and it makes sense that we tuned in more because right. we want to manage our anxiety, we want to see what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, however, um, I know for me, I was trying to control it by learning as much as I could, but I wasn't feeling any less anxious. Right. So I was still feeling that anxiety. And unfortunately, um, you know, there's some things where you're never going to have certainty. It's always, it's always going to be ambiguous and you're never going to know. Right. So, um, so the result of watching that, I mean, I could feel the anxiety. You could feel the anxiety of, of consuming so much. Um, and the research bears that out. So the research indicates that the more media you consume, whether it's television, social media, streaming, et cetera, mm -hmm. the more likely you are to be depressed. Wow. Um, even with each hour, your likelihood goes up that you spend consuming media. And that's for both um, kids and adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems like we're, we're feeling anxious, we're feeling depressed, we're almost going to media for some kind of relief, mm -hmm. but the research and even our lived experience is saying that uh, it's actually having the opposite effect of the mm -hmm. reason that we're going to it. And so I, I wonder if you could just kind of help us understand on a psychological or neurological level, what's actually happening there mm -hmm. when we're in, in this constant state of media saturation and our levels of depression and anxiety, and we mm -hmm. even saw suicide rates mm -hmm. just really going through the roof mm -hmm. during this time. Yeah. There's something that we call a depression spiral, where um, you have just your environment, a life stressor that's happening, and let's say you start to think negatively about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You think negatively about yourself, so maybe you start to withdraw. Um, you start to withdraw, you don't do the things that you once enjoyed, and when you do that, you feel worse. Right. Um, you start having worse thoughts about yourself or about your situation. Um, so maybe it's difficult to sleep. And what happens when we don't sleep? We're more irritable, mm -hmm. we can't think right, um, which causes the spiral to go further and further down. And so it's a very, it's a very real spiral that we can quickly fall into if we're not careful. So we have this depression spiral. Mm -hmm. And so it's like uh, 
we get depressed and then we tend to go to things that actually make us more depressed. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the news or that's social media or that's comparison. And I feel bad because I'm comparing myself. Mm -hmm. And so since I feel bad, I go back to social media, which is mm -hmm. where I compare myself. Mm -hmm. So I feel even worse about myself. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds on the surface kind of easy, like mm -hmm. stop doing that, you know? Mm -hmm. But all of us in our lived experience know it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And I guess from, from your research and your clinical work, you know, what is, what's happening inside of us that is just making it so difficult to break free of that? Mm -hmm. Well, we once understood our brains to be static and unchanging. Once we reached adulthood, we thought our brains were just fully developed and that's it. Mm -hmm. Now we understand that we have neuroplasticity. Okay. And neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to grow and change over time. So what happens is every time you think a thought, have a feeling, um, make a decision, have a behavior, your brain makes a connection, it makes a path. Mm -hmm. And that path is made stronger every time you repeat it. So if you are, um, for example, uh, making a choice about what to eat for dinner and you choose a hamburger over a piece of broccoli, mm -hmm. your brain makes that connection. And every time you repeat it, that connection gets stronger and stronger and stronger and mm -hmm. it becomes harder to take a different path. And so that's what's happening um, inside our brains. Wow, so, mm -hmm. it, and, and we know that these apps are programmed to make it easy mm -hmm. and to make it addicting. Mm -hmm. And we are almost programming ourselves then um, by taking in this media, thinking that we're doing it to learn, thinking we're doing it for our own benefit. But really it sounds like what you're saying is we're almost tethering ourselves and forming our brains to become dependent on the very things that are making us anxious, mm -hmm. making us depressed. Yeah, and I don't know if you've ever caught yourself, I know I have, where I've pulled out my phone for something and I don't even know why I did it. Like right. it, was just, it was just a habit to pull it out yeah. and I'm saying, why am I doing this? And it was just my body on autopilot. Christine sees patients all of the time who are significantly upset with the form their life has taken, where they find themselves, the way that they make decisions, the way that they navigate relationships. And there's this direct link to the information that they are taking in. What Christine is describing is a truth that Jesus taught us about a couple thousand years ago. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus says, For from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. This is a, a pretty incredible passage of scripture. This is the first century AD. This is a pre-science world. They don't understand biology or neurology or psychology or sociology. They don't understand any of that. And so a murder is something that takes place outside. It's something in the external world, robbing. Adultery, those are things that take place outside of you. And yet Jesus, who is the agent of creation, who knows all, is teaching this truth at a level that they could understand that, that all of those things actually begin within. We're talking about information because information puts us in formation. Information puts your life in formation. And we are in this technological revolution that we don't understand, that we have no idea what it's actually causing or the depth of problems that it might create. And it's time to just ask, what are we putting inside? What is the information diet that you are currently on? If it's true that information puts us in formation, then we must become intentional about what information we allow in our lives. Everybody knows that the food you put in your stomach is going to affect your life. You cannot eat cake for breakfast, cake for lunch, cake for dinner, cake for midnight snack every day, all day. You will die and not like a long time from now. We all know that. And yet, we consume toxic information hours and hours a day as if it will not have just as critical of an impact 
and the person that we are becoming? What information are we feeding ourselves? Are you tired of the endless string of tragedies that are constantly coming in front of you that you can do nothing about? Are you tired of demonizing half of the population of the country just because you have a difference of political opinion? What you allow in your mind makes its way to your heart. If you are on a diet of constant fear, is it any wonder that you are just riddled with anxiety? If you are on a constant diet of comparison, is it any wonder that your self-worth continues to deteriorate? If you are on a constant diet of pornography, is it any wonder that your marriage is struggling and lacking intimacy? Jesus says it starts from within. Information puts us in formation. It shapes and molds and forms our life. And what Christine just told us is that's not just a metaphor. The information that you are taking in day after day is actually shaping and molding your mind. It is creating new neural connections and shaping the person who you are slowly but surely becoming. And so maybe you're like not super happy about even being at Meta Church today. You know, maybe someone dragged you to one of the venues. Maybe someone kind of is forcing you to watch online with them. I get it. I really do get it. Maybe church is not your thing, but I promise you this question is worth your time. You're already here. You might as well contend with the question of whether or not you are actually happy, satisfied, and fulfilled with the form that your life has taken. Are you good with your life? Are you happy with how things are turning out? Are you content in your work? Do you look forward to your relationships? Do you have a real framework for making critical decisions in your life? Are you happy with the state of your mental health? If you are unhappy with the form your life has taken, there is a solution. It starts with changing what informs, because that information will put your life in formation. And today I want to suggest three steps. And these are three steps that if we will really take them, number one, it says that we are a movement that is serious about actually meeting our potential as individuals to make an impact during our time on earth. These are three steps that can change the form of your life because it will give you a meaningful way to challenge the information you allow into your life. We're going to start in Romans chapter 12. The apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome and he said, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed, be transformed. And whether you are going to be conformed to all the patterns of this world, I'm going to suggest that's a really bad idea. Because if you just open your eyes and take a cursory look at what is going on in the world around you, I don't think that's the path you want to walk down. Whether we are conformed to this world or transformed into the person we were created to be comes down to how we are informed by what we allow inside of us. And so if you take nothing today seriously, and, and if you take no actual steps towards managing your information intake, you will be conformed. It is the natural order of things. It is like gravity pulling you towards what the rest of the world is doing. It is the current of culture that you will get caught up in. And people are conformed to villains or to victims. And we know the villains. They're very easy to spot because they take what does not belong to them from the people who need it the most. Others are conformed to the victims. And we celebrate victims now. We celebrate victimhood now. We celebrate people who, with no initiative on their own, love to raise their own social status by talking about all of the things that haven't gone right in the world. And so you can be a victim, or you can be a villain, or you can be transformed into the hero that God created you to be. And your mind is more powerful than you can imagine. And the fuel for your mind is the information you allow inside of it. 
And so step one, we must delete what defeats. If you're taking notes, we must delete what defeats. And there's a lot of good information out there. And, and we're really just going to swing for the fences on step one. Because this, I think this is the hardest part. And I'm not saying don't be informed. News itself is not bad. However, there are things that are informing your life. There are people that you follow and there are shows that you watch. There are podcasts you listen to. There are people that you spend time with that have absolutely no redeeming value. They are nothing but toxic. And if they have no redeeming value, then they will lead to your defeat and you don't need it. And your life matters too much for your life to be destroyed by bad actors in the world, by biased opinions in the media, by fear mongering and sellers who want your attention but don't care about your potential. And so it's time to delete it. And every one of us probably has 30 to 70% of the things that we are following that if we were honest, have no redemption. And that is the filter for deciding what to delete. Is there any redemptive value? Does this add value in any way to my life? And if you can't answer how it does that, immediately delete it. If you have to like stretch your mind to your intellectual capacities to try and rationalize why you should keep watching, keep listening, or keep scrolling, delete it. And there are people who could completely change their mental health just by unfollowing, by one intentional afternoon of screening everyone they follow and unfollowing the people who are doing nothing but adding toxic information to your mind. You are being sold as much fear and division as possible because that is what keeps you scrolling. Happy videos? Like a video of a puppy taking a nap with a duck, you know? All that makes you want to do is go live your life. That will make you close the app. If you close the app, you win. But the app loses. And the question is, are you going to allow yourself to be defeated by something that you actually have control over? Life is hard enough without bombarding ourselves with toxic information that will put your life in toxic formation. Step one is to delete what defeats. And that's an important first step. But there's more. After you have deleted what defeats, you have to begin to curate your content. To curate your content. And maybe you're not familiar with the word curate. The best way to think about it is to think about a museum. At a museum of art, there are art creators. Those are the people who, you know, paint the pictures and, and, and mold the clay and draw the drawings, you know. Those are the art creators. But every museum has art curators. And a curator doesn't actually paint or draw or sculpt, what a curator does is they take all of the different art pieces and they painstakingly, meticulously, and intentionally decide which pieces pair with which other pieces, what room they go in, and how they should be displayed. And a great art curator can take good art, surround it by other good art, and make all of it exponentially better. When you walk into a room or an exhibit at a museum and it does something and touches you and moves your emotions, it's part creator because they made the art, but it is part curator because they chose where it went. The content is being created for us. The question is, are we curating it? Are we intentional and meticulous and precise about what content goes where? In Philippians 4, it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. You know what that is? You know what Philippians 4 is? It is the curation criteria. If what you're allowing in your life does not pass the Philippians 4 test, then move back to step one and delete what defeats. 
But if it is lovely, and if it is pure, and if it is honoring, and if it is praiseworthy, and if it edifies you, and if it builds you up and pushes you towards your potential, those are the things to allow into your life. We're so desperate to be liked. We're so desperate to be accepted and appreciated that this is how we choose our friends. Oh, you want to be friends with me? Okay. And that's your new friend. Like, that's it. That's the whole test. This is how people are hooking up. It's like, I don't know if I like you or would marry you or even want to date you, but you find me just barely attractive enough to have sex with me? Okay. What if we curated our relationships? What if we were intentional? What if we were trying to build something out of them that actually did something for our lives? What if we curated our social media content? Because everyone has a bias. Everyone has a bias. You have a bias. And the more that you try to convince me you don't, the more I will not believe you. Everyone has a bias. And so you have to balance your bias. You have to negotiate what is newsworthy. Not everything is worth your time. You have to screen your sources. There's a great example right now because there's another conflict in the Middle East. And man, you go online and everyone is either over here or over here. And the people over here hate the people over here. And the people over here hate the people over here. And I'll give you a hint. The truth is always somewhere in the middle. And you'll never find the middle if you don't battle your biases. And you'll never find the middle if you don't screen your sources. And if you don't care enough about it to do like five minutes of work to find the best resources on both sides, go back to step one, delete what defeats. It's not worth your time. You have too much of a life to live. You have too much of an impact to make. There are too many people hurting who need the people of God to stand up, step up, and do something about it. And so you have to curate your content. We have to seek to understand both sides because God has called us to reach both sides. Philippians 4 is your curation criteria. Balance your biases, screen your sources, negotiate what is newsworthy. And finally, and this is another hard one, once you've deleted what defeats and curated your content, you have to limit your listening. In Colossians 3 it says, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your mind on things above, not on the earthly things. And in order to seek the things above, we must set our mind on God. And we learned this over the last three weeks, that we are called to seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness first. God over everything, building his kingdom, orienting our life towards the highest possible good. And that means setting your mind. Not being conformed, but being transformed, dwelling on the things that are above, the things that will lift you up and push you towards your purpose. You have to limit your listening. And some of us have no idea what God wants for our life because we never make room to listen to him. If we're going to set our mind on God, then we actually have to have some space for God in our life. We have to put down the phones and turn off the TVs. We have to begin to listen. If we're serious about seeking, we may have to set limits. Did you know that you could hand your phone over to your spouse and they can set a code and put time limits on your apps? Oh, you mean let them infringe on my own freedoms? Yes! Do you care about the life you've been given or not? And it's like, well, I have a long drive, you know, and that's what I do. I just listen to, listen to something else. Download an audio book. The Bible will read to you. Sit in silence and pray and seek God. This is hard, man. I'm terrible about, terrible about this. I'm taking in content all of the time, and it's curated content. It is curated content. I'm trying really hard. Uh, let me tell you something. I care a lot about current events, but I will not allow current events to get in the way of my impact on people's eternal destinies. It's curated content, but we have to limit our listening because it's not just about the quality of content or the quality of information. It is also about the quantity. You can delete what defeats and you can curate your content, but if you flood yourself with too much of it, you will not leave room for the necessary work of allowing God to move in your life. 
And those are our steps. And I hope that you'll remember them. We delete what defeats. And you could take two hours this afternoon and you could screen all of the people you're following and you could make some really tough decisions. And if you just can't turn off the 24-hour news cycle, if it's always playing in your house, cut your cable. And I know you have an excuse not to. It's like, well, I mean, I, I would love to get rid of the cable, but how am I going to watch the Cowboys games? And it's like, well, there's your mental health problems right there as you keep watching the Cowboys. And so the question is, how serious are we, you know? And are we going to fight through all the rationalizations of why you should keep following that person and why you should keep listening to that podcast and why you should keep hanging out with these people who are only putting toxic information into your mind? We delete what defeats. You got to curate your content. The artist isn't just the person who puts paint on canvas. The artist is who knows what to do with the art when it's presented to them. Be intentional. Be precise. Make decisions. Don't just let the world make them for you. Your life matters too much. And then limit your listening. Make room. Make room for what God wants to say. Make room for what he wants to do in your life. Make room for what he wants to say to you. If we can take these three steps, I'm serious, you can get some of your life back. And like 40% of the weight of the pandemic that you're carrying around is the new habits that you developed inside of it that increased your media consumption twofold. And, and, and so quit. Take intentional steps, intentional steps. It's one at a time. It takes real intention to go through your list, to go through your feed, to go through who you're following, and to unfollow, to unfollow people you care about. You know, they make it now where you don't have to block them, right? Like, if, if, you don't want, if you don't want the family reunion to be that awkward, you know, you can unfollow them and they'll never know. Take it seriously. Curate your content. Limit your listening. Jesus said, all these problems, all that we deal with, it all starts from within. What are you allowing in your life? What you allow in will make its way out. Men at church, we have the most significant mission on planet Earth. We've been called to join with God for the redemption of his creation. We're living in the middle of a technological revolution. It has incredible benefit. There's incredible power that can be harnessed for good. But if we are not intentional, the technology will not point us towards our purpose. It will derail our destiny. It will sabotage our significance. And your life matters too much to allow that to happen. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you, and this is tough. God, we, we, uh, we have kids, and I mean kids, with smartphones in their pockets, with all the technology and all the information and all the world on them. And God, how are we, as the adults and parents, supposed to help them manage their information diet if we are not managing it ourselves? And so God, I pray that we would take this extremely serious. I pray that we would walk through these steps, maybe even before the day is over, that we will have taken steps to delete the things that are nothing but toxic in our lives. That before the end of this week, that we will have done in intentional work to curate the content that we're allowing in our lives. God, that we will get help, get help from friends, from a spouse, from peers, coworkers to limit our listening, to make room for what you're wanting to say to us, God. Allow ourselves the breaks that we used to have, God. We used to have the natural breaks from the information, and now we're just surrounded. I pray we would find those breaks. We would find those oasis in the desert of information where we can just rest and be nourished. God, we can't do any of this without you, and so we, we ask for your help. We ask for your Spirit's guidance. God, and we do all of this for you to live out our purpose and to join with the work you're doing on earth. We love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of things before you guys go. Uh, I just want to say again, it, it means a lot when you guys show up. So thank you so much for being here, for being a part of Meta Church. Next Sunday is our Feed SA food drive. And uh, 
let's get it, man. There are a lot of organizations participating. We're all going to do our part. We are going to beat those other organizations. We're going to bring more. It's not about that. It's not about that. Um, but we are going to beat them. But it's not about that. But we are going to beat them. But let, let, let's really blow it out. Um, you know, we've done several times where we just put, put out a can in our neighborhood and we throw it up on the neighborhood Facebook. And you'll be surprised. People will come and donate. And if we all do our part, we can stand in the gap for all of these kids who lose their lunches during the summer. And so I'm excited to see uh, how we all show up next week for that. Listen, if you need to pray with someone or talk with someone, our prayer team is always over in the cafe area. As always, we encourage you guys to invite and to invest. This is a movement worth inviting people to, and this is a movement worth you investing in. And so let's make sure we're all doing our part financially. If we all do our part, make our proper sacrifice. God will do the rest to keep us going and to keep us growing. I love you guys. We hope to see you here next week. Thanks for joining us today at MetaChurch Online. We would love to know how God is using this ministry to affect your life. If you have a story about how God has spoken to you through this online platform, we would love to hear about it. You can send an email to info at metachurch.tv. We would also love for you to partner with us financially to help us continue to expand what God is doing through Meta Church. You can do that very easily at metachurch.tv by clicking on the Give button. You can give a one-time donation or you can set up to give recurringly and to continually support what God is doing. Every time you give, you invest in eternity. We hope to see you here next week.